Welcome Sears Pool customers. Thank you for joining us for our customer orientation program. We're sorry that we can't meet you in person today, but uh, we look forward to providing this information to you virtually so that uh, you have what you need to get your pool season started. So we're gonna start with an introduction of our staff. Um, of course, you probably know me, I'm Craig Sears, president and founder. Uh, Jimmy Don Murray is our operations manager. He runs all of our field staff. Katie Houston is our staffing manager and she runs all of our uh, our summer staff, so that would be our lifeguards and pool attendants. Beth Glover is our bookkeeper. She handles all of uh, invoicing and, and accounting. And then we have a big operations team. We have our regional manager, Boyan, uh, and our maintenance supervisors, Igor, Lazar, James, Ray, Yvonne, Sean, Dalton, Peter, Chris, Rob, Skyler, Alex, and Merle. Um, and if you want to know who your maintenance supervisor is, you can send an email to uh, amila at service.request at searspool.com and request your uh, maintenance supervisor's contact information. So our admin, or well, I'm sorry, finishing up our service team, our repair tech is uh, Mark Perryman and his assistant, Fidel Martinez. Customer service administrator is Amila, that's who I just mentioned, and she manages the service request email, so that's an email that you're gonna wanna use a lot. The administrative team consists of Tamara, Megan, and Melissa. And they will help you with any scheduling questions. And uh, our mission statement, we'd like to go over this. Our mission is to provide our customers with the widest variety of pool-related uh, services performed with unparalleled professionalism and customer service. And we hold ourselves to the highest standards of integrity and quality because our customers deserve the best. We have assembled a top-notch team who we believe are the best in the industry. So when are we open? Well, we're open right now, uh, Monday through Friday, nine to five, although we do have people working on the weekends, the office hours are, are, not, um, are not there nine to five. And then starting May 18th, we will go to daily uh, operation in the office from nine to five through the end of uh, most of September when, when we expect pool season to wrap up. Uh, after hours emergencies are available 24 seven via the office voicemail. So what you would do is you'd call into the office number and it will prompt you, you can go to option eight, and that'll put you directly in touch with the person on call. The manager on call changes weekly, so that way you don't have to uh, think of a new number or remember a new number each week. You just call the office uh, if you have an after hours emergency and you'll be put directly in touch with that on call manager. So what's happening at your pool? Well, right now we're getting your pool ready for opening day. We've got a lot of things uh, that we've been doing the last four to six weeks to get your pools ready. So we're pulling the covers, we're inspecting your pumps, filters, getting them started, uh, replacing items that are uh, under, actually that's supposed to be 125, that's a typo. Uh, balancing the pool's chemistry, vacuuming the pool, bringing the pool furniture out, and cleaning it and setting it out. Now this, obviously, we have delayed this this season because of coronavirus, and we are we are waiting for your direction as far as when you would like the furniture cleaned and, and set out, pending your opening. And of course, we're scheduling your inspections as we're able, and we're gonna talk about that more, but you know, some of the counties are not scheduling inspections yet, some of them are. Um, if you're concerned about your pool in particular, that service request email that I mentioned is the best way to get an answer about what's happening at your pool, service.request at searspool.com. So what do, we, uh, what do we need you to do for pool opening? We need you to file that annual operating permit. If you want us to assist with that, we can certainly do that, but we, you just need to let us know. Uh, some counties let, let us work directly with them. Other counties won't unless you send the paperwork to us. If you are planning spring maintenance projects, such as pressure washing, painting, remodeling, or anything like that, please let us know that now so that we can uh, adjust our maintenance schedules. Your phone should already be turned on and operating at this point, and make sure that when you dial 911 from the phone that it is actually showing your pool name, uh, HOA, with the correct address. So that way, if an emergency happens at your pool, EMS can get to the right location. Dewinterize the bathrooms and the water fountains. Um, that's something that, that either you or us can do, depending upon what's necessary. Uh, make sure your pool gates are functioning properly and your fence is in good repair, just in case you had any vandalism or uh, issues over the, the off season. And then of course designate, if you haven't already, one or two representatives who are gonna be our primary points of contact for us this season so that we can have a good uh, stream of communication. 
So what do we provide? Well, we provide all the chemicals for you, all the standard ones. And we provide your restroom supplies if that's included in your contract. So that includes disinfectant, paper towels, toilet paper, uh, trash can liners, and hand soap. We provide refills for your test kits and first aid kits throughout the season. The initial kit itself, if you don't provide it, we can provide, but there is a charge for the initial kit of the test kit or the uh, first aid kit. And what are you responsible for providing? Well, we need to have um, the top list here is your, your health department uh, requirements. Those include signage. So you gotta have a no lifeguard on duty sign, a 911 sign, and pool rules, which are county specific. They now call that sign pool risks. Uh, ring buoy with rope, shepherd's hook and pole, deep end rope with buoys, um, chemical test kit and first aid kit. Per the American Red Cross guidelines, these items are recommended for any pools where we staff lifeguards. We should have a rescue tube in good condition, backboard, and an umbrella for the lifeguard. Also, we're gonna be adding to that list this year, uh, bag valve masks. Blower for debris removal on the deck is something that you would need to provide if you want the lifeguard or the staff to do. Our maintenance supervisors have those with them on their trucks, so they'll use theirs when they come to the pool. But if you want our summer staff to use them, um, you would have to provide that on site. And of course, of course, hoses that are long enough to reach the entire deck and the bathrooms. Um, if you have tile walls, we can, we can hose the, the restrooms out as well. Uh, vacuum head, hose, telescopic pole, vinyl and steel brushes, and leaf nets, those are all the cleaning utensils that you should be providing uh, or should already be on site. If those are not on site, those are also items that we stock and we can provide them to you at, at an additional cost. And then finally, brooms and dust pans and mops and that sort of thing to help um, clean the, the restrooms. So signage requirements. Um, Cobb, Douglas, and Fulton enforce these signage requirements. Um, as stated in the Georgia State Code, Forsyth and Pauling, while they don't necessarily enforce, uh, they, do, um, they do fall under that state code and the other counties um, as well, Gwinnett, the cab. Um, the signs may have specific verbiage and letter sizing, so there may be slightly different uh, ones per county, so you want to make sure that you get a sign that is right for your county if you're not ordering through us. Now, we of course, we will stock all the ones for the different counties and we can provide them to you uh, without a problem. So new signs, uh, pool risks I mentioned, um, the COVID-19 signage, we're going to get into that in a minute. Pool capacity, uh, pool hours, no lifeguard on duty, which needs to be at every pool, uh, discussing the risk of drowning, and then of course 911, which needs to be near your phone, indicating the location of your phone in the pool area. So uh, we're gonna go to coronavirus considerations right now, which is, uh, I wanna disclaim this is not legal advice. We are not attorneys. Um, this is basically uh, our understanding, boiling down of all the guidance that has come out so far and where we are in this matter. Today is Monday, May 11th. And um, per the governor's uh, existing executive order, when it expires this uh, Wednesday night at midnight, that's going to be rolling into Thursday, May 14th, pools may open. That's provided that he doesn't extend that or provide additional requirements in order for you to open. Um, what we can tell you is that most pools in the area right now are going to continue to uh, remain closed for now while we await additional guidance, but that's uh, it's going to be an individual association decision to do. So you want to consult with your insurance company, your HOA attorney, and your property manager if you have one so that you fully understand the risk that you have when, when you're opening the pool and that you have a plan in place to mitigate that risk. Do not open unless you have passed inspection if it is required in your county and have a plan to meet the guidance from the CDC and the PHTA. So the CDC and Pool and Hot Tub Alliance have both put out guidance just within the last week. The CDC was only a few days ago. Um, this, these are brand new documents. They are posted on our Facebook page and the links to them are also in this presentation and we'll be happy to provide those to you if you have trouble reading that. Um, but the, these are basically the best guidance that's out there right now um, related to pool opening and how to do it safely. Keep in mind that restrooms must remain open per your county health code. So I know some customers have asked, can we close them? No, that you cannot, we have to keep them open. And so that's gonna be part of the consideration that you have to have is how you're gonna keep those maintained um, at your pool and clean. 
Okay, coronavirus considerations continued. Um, for operational changes, I'm gonna stand over here for a moment. For operational changes, um, we're gonna add hand sanitizer dispensers in the pool area for you if you approve those. Those would be an additional cost, but that is something that we have worked out for you. That is, you'll find in the recommendations and the guidance. Uh, disinfect high touch surfaces daily using EPA approved disinfectants. Uh, change the deck layout to encourage spacing of at least six feet between non-cohabitating uh, groups. So in other words, if you are in a group that's living together and you've been, you've been uh, cohabitating together, you're probably not at, at risk for spreading, um, but we wanna have you separated from other groups. Uh, calculate and post the new maximum bather load using a modified calculation per guidance. So there's several different uh, ways that you can calculate that out there right now. Uh, that will give you some freedom to, to see which one would apply best to your, uh, your situation. We keep in mind, we don't know if the governor comes out with additional guidance, he may specify this is exactly how it has to be calculated. But until then, we're just going with the guidance that, that you can find in those two documents that I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, consider models for crowd control and enforcement. So. Um, this is difficult, but basically, uh, we're usually talking about self-policing here or self-reporting. Um, you can use a reservation system. There are a number of online reservation systems that you can use for uh, reserving time at the pool to try to control how many people are going to the pool at the same time. And then, of course, you can use a video surveillance system. Um, we would recommend, if you are going to use that, use that retroactively after the fact to assess if there's been a problem, what the you know, who's, whose fault it was, and maybe who needs to be banned from the pool or lose their pool privileges if that's the, uh, the decision that the board makes. Um, prohibit parties and large social gatherings at the pool and uh, develop a plan if someone reports illness. So if someone reports illness at the pool, you wanna have a plan uh, to shut down, disinfect everything, and how you're gonna proceed with that. Uh, signage and communication. So remind the patrons that washing hands frequently helps prevent the disease spread but also the coronavirus could still be present in the pool area. So there is a risk when you come in any public area, for that matter, but uh, in particular the pool is what we're talking about right now, of contracting uh, coronavirus because it may be present in that environment. Encourage patrons to wear masks, but remind them not to wear masks in the water. Um, I know that's probably silly, but uh, we don't want people drowning or at risk of drowning because they're trying to wear masks in the water uh, when it would not be appropriate. Stay home if you have COVID-19 symptoms or were exposed to someone with COVID-19. So this is a sign that is being recommended uh, to be placed out. The exact wording of that sign, uh, you probably should, should consult with your HOA attorney on what that should look like. Uh, and then finally, consult with an HOA attorney regarding any waivers that you might wanna have your patron sign prior to using the pool. Um, now, regard to the staffed pools. Lifeguards may assist in breaking up groups in the pool area as a secondary duty, but it cannot be their primary duty, meaning their primary duty has to be patron surveillance and safety. So uh, we can't have them managing crowd control or that could cause issues with them performing their primary responsibilities. Uh, and that would include gate access. So if you're, if you're wanting to control gate access, then you would need to have an attendant to do that. Uh, also, keep in mind that lifeguards should not be expected to sanitize all services. Their primary role there, again, is uh, patron surveillance. Secondary role, one of, one of those secondary duties is cleaning the facility, uh, but keep in mind that they are not cleaning professionals um, in that regard. They are lifeguards. So what if your equipment or, um, or, or repairs are, what if new equipment or repairs are needed during the pool season? So your contract does not include replacement equipment. That would be an additional cost. Any repair for parts and labor would be additional. And extra visits for repairs, contamination, vandalism, or acts of God, or any extra service visits upon request, those would be at an additional cost. For equipment, parts, or repairs that are under $125, your contract allows us to proactively replace those items or complete those repairs. These are designed to cover your routine wear and tear parts, the things that um, need to be replaced just to keep you in compliance with, with county code. Um, and that's why we set that limit at 125. Most of those parts can fall under that, uh, that limit. If it is over $125, then we are gonna seek approval from you first before uh, proceeding with any repair. 
So what if you have a question about an invoice or a repair, um, for a repair or an extra visit? Well, you would want to contact Amila, and remember she is our customer service administrator for the operations department, and she can be reached at service.request at searspool.com or just the main office line. Uh, Amila is the one who handles the invoicing out of any repair uh, invoices, and we will investigate uh, thoroughly explain all charges, make sure that everybody agrees on that before proceeding. Uh, but if there is a dispute or a question about an invoice, don't be afraid to ask a question. We want to help get that resolved as soon as possible. Now, if you have a question about a contract payment invoice, you would contact Beth. She's our bookkeeper. She sends out the invoices for those. And she can be reached at accounting at searchpool.com or the main office line, 770-993-7492. So keys, cards, and lockbox codes. We will put keys that you give us in a lockbox at your pool for our usage. And once we have uh, put the keys in there, um, we ask that you, we can share that code with you if you'd like, but we ask that you not give it out to other vendors because then the keys tend to develop legs and we have a hard time getting the access that we need when, when we need to be there. Uh, so please, if you've got other contractors like landscapers, uh, swim team personnel, caterers, DJs, anybody else needing access to the pool, please provide them with their own set of keys um, and, and, not, and, and prefer, preferably not using our keys. For security reasons, we do change our lockbox code every year. So this way, um, any employees that were working the year before won't have the code for this year. So now your pool is open, what happens next? This is once your pool opens, of course. Um, your pool maintenance supervisor will be servicing your pool as outlined in your contract. So that's typically gonna be either two or three times a week. And the service includes testing and balancing your chemicals, checking and servicing the pump room equipment, vacuuming the pool and blowing the pool deck, restocking supplies, emptying trash, cleaning restrooms, uh, if that is included. And then we make quality control visits, uh, our management staff does. So that includes our operations manager, regional manager, operations assistant and myself and sometimes the staffing manager as well. If you have any questions about the service of your pool, here again that magic email is service.request at searspool.com. And Amila will get that and she, if she can't answer the question, she will get it to the person who can. So is your pool swim at your own risk? Um, if it is, make sure that you, um, your insurance properly covers swim at your own risk. Um, and you must have proper signage posted, and really that should be posted at every pool anyway, it's so much your own risk, but um, because even if you have a lifeguard, there are times when the lifeguard goes on break, and you want that sign up there to cover your, your liability that, during that time as well. So ensure that your access points are secure, make sure that children are being supervised, and keep in mind that when you do have a so much your own risk scenario, that uh, residents are gonna have to clean up after themselves, they're gonna have to be perhaps more responsible than if they were at a pool where they, there are staff there. Also, you may have more a higher risk of vandalism at pools where there is uh, swim and churn risk. So the new sign that is required looks something like this. So when your lifeguard is on duty, then as I've mentioned before, the number one priority of our lifeguards is patron safety. So they supervise um, the, the pool area by pri providing proper surveillance and consistent rule enforcement. And we ask that you as a board member or property manager support them in their rule enforcement. Pool rules need to be posted uh, clearly visible to all patrons. If there are specific rules for your community, we ask that you provide those in addition, or sorry, in advance of the season so that we can add that to the lifeguard manual and inform all the lifeguards that are working at that pool that these additional rules apply. Violation of any pool rules should result in uh, disciplinary action up to and including dismissal from the pool facility. The lifeguard re uh, retains the right to remove people from the pool facility. <clears throat> um, remember, no glass is allowed in the pool area. Lifeguard breaks are necessary. So in common lingo, we often call this adult swim. We'll talk about later why that's really not the best uh, verbiage to use, but that's what most people recognize. Um, but it is a lifeguard break, and it is time for them to take a break, do some of their secondary duties, but also to get rehydrated, use the restroom, make a phone call, eat, etc. 
And we ask that, that uh, you please reinforce with your members that the lifeguards should be, retreated, should be treated with respect at all times. If there is an issue with a lifeguard that requires disciplinary action, we ask that you please bring that to our staffing manager's attention, contact Katie, and let her address uh, that with the lifeguard. What we don't want to do is we don't want to have a, an altercation um, at the pool where a lifeguard feels that they have been humiliated and their power has been taken away and they're going to have a hard time from, for uh, recovering from that. But we also want to make sure that if they have made a poor judgment call that we address that. So if you have a gate attendant, the number one prior priority of our gate attendants is enforcing your client membership usage. So gate attendants are not lifeguards or security officers. They should be provided a list of members who are, who are um, not in good standing or a list of members who are in good standing. That's at your discretion. Uh, gate attendants verify that members are in good standing uh, if they have the proper access code or FOB is really the best way to do it. That way you're not pulling, having them pull out names. Um, Non-residents or guests must be accompanied by a member to gain access. And in addition to monitoring or ent uh, entry to the pool, they can also perform some secondary duties, which include opening and closing of the pool, chemical checks, light cleaning of the restrooms and restocking, trash removal, straightening furniture, and enforcing a no smoking and no glass policy at the pool. So rule enforcement for water features. If your pool has a deep end, diving board, or water slide, these are some common rules that should be enforced there. No child should be permitted in the deep end of the pool unless he or she can demonstrate an ability to swim um, across the width of the pool in good form and tread water for at least 30 seconds. One person at a time should be on the diving board, one bounce and jump, no double bounces. Diving is allowed only in the deep end. Deep end is pretty much defined as over five feet in depth. And please make sure that if you uh, if you have a feature like a diving board or a water slide that you do have that specifically mentioned and covered by your insurance policy that it is not excluded. Some communities don't realize until there's an accident that those features have been excluded in their policy and then that's not a good time to find that out when there's an accident. Always follow the manufacturer guidelines for, for use with the slide, one person on at a time, no trains going down the water slide, always go down feet first, and no flotation devices. If a child is wearing a flotation device, that's a sign that they're probably not ready to go down the slide by themselves. Going down the slide on a lap is also uh, not allowed because of the first rule is one person at a time. If a child needs to go down on the lap, it's probably a sign that that child is not ready to ride the water slide. The Fair Housing Act and your pool. The Fair Housing Act is a law that applies to all community associations and it protects against discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, re uh, religion, sex, familial status, or handicap. The area where it most commonly comes into play with swimming pools is familial status. Sometimes we set up rules with good intentions, but they actually will violate the Fair Housing Act. And so what we can do is we can put in, you can use the FHA test for your pool rules. So if you have a pool, new pool rule that you're thinking about and you're trying to separate uh, time when, let's say, adults and children can, can uh, use the pool, i.e. adult swim, um, that is not an FHA safe term to use. Why is that? Because you have discriminated on the basis of familial status. You're preventing children from having same access to the pool as an adult. And so that's why we're not supposed to use that term. So what you can do to kind of help determine if your rule is in violation, your proposed rule is in violation of the FHA, is you can substitute in another protected class. And when you do that, you will quickly, it will quickly become obvious whether or not your, your rule is enforceable. So for instance, if you were to blow, if we, if we were to blow our whistle and the lifeguard said, okay, Catholic only swim time, obviously that would not go over very well because that's discrimination on the basis of religion. So in the same respect by saying adult swim or adults only at this time, um, even though that is commonly understood, it is technically a violation of the Fair Housing Act and should not be um, the appropriate rule enforced at your pool. Uh, again, when we're talking about age discrimination, uh, if you have a rule that says kids under three must wear swim diapers, that's an age discrimination rule. 
Uh, you wouldn't have um, something that uh, that was, you know, let's say race related, uh, must wear swim diapers, that would be completely inappropriate, right? So you can't do that with kids either. But you can say all incontinent guests must wear swim diapers. So that also um, addresses anybody with incontinence issues regardless of age. So we've just talked about this, um, adult swim versus lifeguard break slash safety break. Uh, we prefer to call it lifeguard break, even though some people still understand adult swim better. So the recommended age for children to swim without adult supervision is between 12 and 14, and that comes from uh, legal precedent. There's not a clear uh, law or statement about that. That just comes from legal precedent, where it, it has been deemed to be uh, at that age, you can say that they should have a keen understanding of the risks of being around water, and therefore it would be okay for them to be near water and not, uh, they would not be putting themselves in danger without really understanding the risk of being near water. So what if my pool has both swim and trail risk and lifeguard coverage? This can be a little difficult for both the lifeguards and the patrons. Uh, because the patrons get used to kind of doing what they want when the lifeguard's not there. And then when the lifeguard's there, all of a sudden they have to obey these rules. So it becomes um, extra important for, for you as a board member or property manager to reinforce to the members that they really should be following these rules all the time, uh, but that they are going to be enforced when the lifeguard is there. And just because they may have gotten away with something when the lifeguard wasn't there doesn't mean they will be able to get away with it when the lifeguard is there. Remember that you should always have a no lifeguard on duty or swim at your own risk sign at all pools. And waiting pools are pretty much always considered swim at your own risk, so that means that the, the parent or guardian should always be with a child there. So let's talk about how to properly staff your pool. Industry standard recommendations for guard staffing are about one guard for every 25 to 30 patrons for flat water. When we're talking about flat water, we're talking about where there's no visual obstructions. So pretty much all, almost all HOA and association pools would fall into the category of flat water, as opposed to say uh, a, a water park where you have um, a lot of uh, visual uh, obstructions in your view. So consider the shape of your pool, play structures, uh, glare is a common thing that we, we worry about uh, when, when we're staffing lifeguards and where the location of the station is. If you've got a permanently affixed station, the lifeguard, there may be a certain part of the day where the lifeguard does not have a good view because of a glare issue. And so they may have to get down or shift on the stand uh, to get a better view of their zone. We recommend opening the pool with the lifeguard no earlier than 10 a.m. and closing the pool no later than 9 p.m. Simply because it's difficult, it's usually there's not much advantage to staffing beyond those hours as far as additional patron usage and it also becomes increasingly difficult uh, to staff beyond those hours. On holidays consider that uh, and again this is during normal considerations obviously we're entering a season here where um, COVID-19 is a big concern and we, we know that our, our bather load is going to be reduced. But on holidays consider that you would staff up to accommodate any neighborhood parties which probably aren't going to happen this year but um, and then after July 4th when swim team season is over, a lot of people go on vacation. This is a normal normal season. I think we may see more people going on vacation earlier this year, simply because so many activities have been canceled. So I think we're, we're probably gonna see uh, somewhat lower usage uh, in some regards, not, or at least not traditional usage in our traditional uh, ebbs and flows. So uh, the true Summer pool season is really Memorial Day weekend to Labor Day weekend, but here in the Metro Atlanta area, we have nice weather longer than that, so people like to keep their, their pools open longer. So just because of that, though, doesn't necessarily mean that staff is always available. Keep in mind that the college guards are usually not returning from school, and again, this is during a normal year, not this year, uh, until about uh, late May or uh, early June. High school guards are, are basically preparing for their final exams, SATs, ACTs, and things like that. Problems and graduations, which unfortunately are not happening so much this year. Uh, but I think some of them may be rescheduled for midsummer. Uh, some of those events may be scheduled for, for midsummer. We'll just have, have to uh, look out for that. Uh, and new guards are still receiving their training and certification. This is definitely a factor right now because all of our training has been put on hold for the last two months during this uh, pandemic. 
Other difficult times to staff are the holidays. So if you're thinking about special events or planning special events, which really are not going to be as, I think, as widely occurring this year, unless uh, situations improve dramatically, just think about planning ahead. But bottom line is we do everything that we can to prevent having an empty guard chair when there's supposed to be a guard there. So special events and parties, I'm gonna skip through this pretty quickly because you probably should not be having large parties at your pool this summer, at least, uh, at least for the first half of the pool season. But suffice it to say, we do have a process for that. If you'd like to request additional guard coverage for that later in the season, um, you can do that through uh, our website at searspool.com. And we just need at least a seven day advance notice uh, with payment for the, for the guard. Uh, it is $28 per hour and with a two hour minimum. And we staff based upon uh, the industry standard staffing range, which is on the form that you'll see online on our website. Uh, we also provide water watcher cards, which if you're interested, um, these are great, especially for some of your own risk pools, which basically it's a lanyard with a card on it that says that you're the water watcher. And it helps designate who's in charge uh, of watching the water at that time while you have a group of people at the pool. Um, very helpful for drowning prevention. Could also potentially be helpful if you've got um, uh, neighborhood volunteers that are, that are helping with social distancing uh, protocols this summer. If your pool is not regularly staffed with lifeguards, you can still hire one of our guards um, to work a party for you. You would just contact us in the same way and we can, we can still staff the party for you. If your pool has a swim team, um, a lot of swim teams this summer are probably not happening, unfortunately. Um, but if you are having a swim team this summer, uh, let us know when those events are so that we can plan ahead. I know a lot of this is in limbo right now. The leagues are really struggling with uh, how to respond to this coronavirus pandemic. So what can shut your pool down? These are the top reasons why the health department would shut it down. If your phone is not working, and it has to be a landline phone, no green buoy on the deck, no deep end rope in place, that's only needed if you have more than five feet of depth in your pool, your shepherd's hook is missing or not attached to the pole, your main drain grate is cracked or open, or broken, sorry, uh, chlorine is too high or too low, pH is too high or too low, cloudy water so that the bottom of the pool is not clearly visible. If you cannot see the bottom of the pool clearly, you cannot see a body on the bottom of the pool and your pool should close. If your water fountain is not working, that's in some counties. Any gate or fence problems. So gates have to be self-closing and self-latching. If they are not self-closing and self-latching, that is a drowning risk and you will get shut down by the county. If your fence has holes in it that allow little children to get through, that will get you shut down. <clears throat> Proper signage also must be displayed. For now, we have pool close signs on our pools until we are sure that we're going to be able to open them and until you uh, have your plan in place and how you're going to open it. So pool contaminations, let's talk about this fun topic. So you can probably expect that at some point during the season, somebody may contaminate your pool. So the standard procedure is to clear the pool, remove as much contaminant as possible, call our office to report the contamination, and either your maintenance supervisor or the on-site staff will take the chemical reading and add the appropriate chemicals um, at that time. The type of contamination will determine how long the pool uh, must be shut down. So this is a funny uh, little mnemonic that one of my, my good friends came up with, but two if it's poo, 20 if it's runny. So what they're referring to there is the, the PPM, the parts per million of chlorine that has to be in the pool. So you have to have at least two parts per million if it's solid feces uh, and close the pool for 25 minutes. If it is diarrhea, we're going to have to raise the pool uh, chlorine all the way up to 20 parts per million, which is very high, and the pool will have to be uh, closed for 24 hours. Vomit is treated the same as feces, so it's a, it's a uh, 20 or 25 minute closure with a chlorine level of two or higher. In emergency situations, um, our personnel, if they're on site, we are trained to call 911 immediately, um, and we ask you to do the same. So make that call first, then call our office. Um, if we are providing lifeguards for you, they will fill out an incident report form after they respond to the, to the incident. Uh, if you would like a copy of that, you can request that, we can provide it to you. 
Uh, we are open daily in season. We do have an uh, emergency 24-hour on-call manager at all times. Please do not leave email or voicemail messages for regular staff members if you have an, a true emergency because they may not get it till the next business day. Um, the pool cannot reopen after emergency until all of these things happen. The pool has to be safe for swimming. Any contaminants have to be removed. The lifeguard has to be emotionally, mentally, and physically prepared to guard again. Um, if you can imagine, if you have just rescued uh, someone and performed a rescue on them, you might be completely exhausted, both mentally, physically, um, and emotionally as a lifeguard. And so you may not be ready to be up on the stand and be uh, mentally alert again. Uh, your safety equipment has to be present in good working order. If you pulled somebody out on a backboard, chances are that EMS is going to take them off um, with that backboard and you may not have that piece of equipment anymore. And then of course the incident form has to be completed before we can reopen. We need to gather information while it's fresh on everyone's mind and interview witnesses uh, who saw what happened as well. For inclement weather, we get a lot of calls about this every year. If it's raining, the pool can remain open as long as you can see the bottom. If it is raining so hard that you can't see the bottom, just like in a cloudy pool, you can't see a body on the bottom, so we need to close the pool. With thunder or lightning, according to the National Lightning Safety Institute, which is the standard that pretty much everybody references uh, in, in life-saving skills, you have to close the pool for 30 minutes after the last thunder or lightning. Please remember that the guards will enforce these rules um, when they're on duty. And if the weather remains, remains inclement, uh, if it looks like it's gonna be an all day storm, then typically we'll call you and alert you to that and you can make a decision if you wanna close down the pool. If we're unable to reach you at about five o'clock and it's still storming and it looks like it's gonna storm for the rest of the evening, then we retain the right to go ahead and, and uh, close the pool and have the lifeguard close up at that time. Pool safety. So these are some statistics that you may or may not know, but drowning is actually the leading cause of accidental injury death among children ages one to four. And it is the second leading when you expand that up to uh, at one to 19. The, the leading cause at that point is traffic injuries and deaths. 90% of child drowning occurs when the caregiver is supervising but became distracted. So what does that mean? Somebody was responsible for watching the child at that moment, but they became distracted with something else. More drowning actually occurs in shallow water than it does in deep water. Approximately 4,000 people drown annually in the United States. Most of that occurs in the summer months, and half of it occurs in group settings meaning there are other people around that are in that group and they do not recognize that person is drowning. 75% of drowning victims are male, so you've got a higher risk if you're a male versus female. And even if your pool is lifeguard staffed, remind your patrons that parents do not abdicate their parental responsibility when they walk through that pool gate just because a lifeguard is there. They are still responsible for keeping an eye on their children. Yes, the lifeguard is watching everyone, but the lifeguard is watching everyone, which means they're not just watching that one child. The normal drowning timeline occurs like this. Uh, someone starts uh, entering the water, they, they're a regular swimmer, then they become a distressed swimmer, which at this point they may be able to call out for help or wait for help or, either, uh, or signal. Uh, but usually that happens because of a cramp or they just, or exhaustion. Uh, or maybe they got too cold, uh, and then they become an active drowning victim. When they become an active drowning victim, as we're going to see here in a minute, they cannot call out for help anymore. And their, their actions may be very normal looking to some who are not trained, and they may be very quiet. And then they become a passive drowning victim if they're not seen. So typically a surface struggle happens uh, within 10 to 20 seconds, then they go underwater for about 30 to 90 seconds, depending upon the individual. Then they become unconscious, and they have hypoxic convulsions, they aspirate water, and about that four minute mark is where clinical death occurs, which is when the heart stops beating, and then beyond four minutes, um, the brain starts dying, and then at, at some point after that, um, they would be declared biologically dead. So 
So obviously that, that means we've got to get to them before that four minute mark. But this video is going to show you um, what it looks like. And then, so the video, um, I hope that you enjoyed the video. I hope that it was eye-opening for you. Um, now let's, took a, let's take a look at the non-swimmer drowning line. It only takes seconds for a child who is a non-swimmer to start drowning. And this is where, remember, it's the number one cause of accidental injury death in children ages one to four. How many children ages one to four know how to swim? Not a lot, not enough. Um, can they learn how to swim at that age? Yes, they can with proper training, but they are probably one of the biggest groups that don't know how to swim and they don't know how to, to, um, to call out for help if they go in the water. So basically, it would look like this. One second, this little toddler falls in the pool. Two seconds, you can see the instinctive drowning response has kicked in. The chin is tilted back, and they're struggling to keep their head up. But you can see that the mouth is closed. They're trying to conserve air. They cannot call out for help. Three seconds, face is under the water. At that point, they're under the water, and they do not have the physical uh, power or knowledge to, or skills to get back up to be able to call for help. So three seconds. How many times have you taken your attention off of your child for three seconds? That's all it took. That's all it takes for somebody to, uh, to drown. So if you're interested, we can do a water safety day event. We have uh, room for a few of these in our schedule each summer. Um, we'll have to modify them a little bit this year due to coronavirus, but uh, we, I think we could still do a water safety day at some pools this summer if you're interested in that. Basically, we would come out and do a presentation uh, for the, the patrons at the pool. And we provide things like safe swimmer pledges, and we talk to um, both the parents and the children about uh, water safety. And um, it's usually a fun and interactive experience for everyone. So now we'll talk about another difficult topic here, uh, VGB compliance. The, uh, the young lady up here to the left of her is Virginia Graham Baker, who died um, tragically in a suction entrapment incident at her home pool um, after she became stuck to a, a main drain in a, in a spa. So um, you, you probably have heard of this law because it's been around for a while now, uh, but what you may not know is that uh, in order to be compliant, you have to, it's just, it's not just the main drain rates, the sumps, which is the area under the main drain rates, have to also be uh, sized appropriately. And the equalizers, which are the fittings underneath your skimmers, also have, also have to have VGB approved outlets on them. Um, the other thing is to keep in mind that these outlets expire every five to seven years. So the old code said, whenever the outlet breaks, replace it. The new code says you have to replace them when they expire. But guess what? There's no national database recording when these were installed, and so therefore you, there's nowhere you can refer to that says when they expire, unless you or your pool company are keeping good records. Now, if we have changed these out for you, we put that in our records and we're able to determine when they expire and let you know. But if you've had somebody else change them out for you, it is incumbent upon the board to track that information and to know when the right time is to, to uh, replace those suction outlets. So pool renovations, these are things that we do all the time and we can help you with if you're interested. That includes pool resurfacing. Uh, we, do, we do regular uh, plaster, quartz, pebble. Um, paint is an option, although we don't like to do paint. Uh, uh, that is kind of a last uh, ditch effort. Uh, it's lower cost, but it makes it a lot harder when you want to go back to a plaster surface later. Uh, retiling, coping replacement, deck resurfacing and replacement, both concrete and, and textured, uh, pump room redesign, kiddie pool redesign, water feature installation, all of these things we can help you with. Optional equipment that we also install frequently and, and highly recommend are things like safety covers. We're a loop lock dealer. Um, best brand in the business. We have uh, installed hundreds of their covers and they're, they're fantastic uh, uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, we are a Tropitone dealer with uh, Tropitone Furniture, so we can, we can quote pool furniture for you. Starting blocks, Lycra chairs, um, and salt systems also. We're an autopilot dealer. 
best um, salt provider, commercial salt provider uh, uh, equipment in the industry. Our quality control. So our quality control consists of uh, several things. We have a service ticket tracking database. So when you email or call into that service dot request email and make a request, uh, Amila will enter that ticket and that ticket gets assigned to a staff member who's then uh, has the responsibility for resolving or concluding that ticket. We also have GPS tracking on our service vehicles so we know when our people are at your pool and how long they're there and, and where they're going. Uh, we also have our quality control visits by our management team and we have our lifeguard scheduling and timekeeping is also done through an online software. So in real time, we can always we can see who's at which pools, when they're there, when they clocked in. Um, it's pretty it's a pretty neat system. We also do in-service training for our lifeguards to keep their skills fresh in the middle of the season, which will look a little bit differently this year because of coronavirus. Uh, but at the end of the day, we still need your eyes and ears to let us know if there's something wrong. There could be something that, that we don't see on our visits to the pool that, that you catch that happens you know, in between our visits. So if you see something like that, please let us know because we want to be part of your team to help address that and fix it. So now we've reached the end of pool season and we're ready to close your pool down. Sad face. Um, so what do we do? Well, when we're closing your pool, we vacuum the pool, uh, we stack and store the pool furniture, we check the condition of all the pool equipment, um, and we winterize the waiting pool if you have one. Now, if you have a cover, we're also going to lower your water level down to the correct level. We're going to install the cover. Uh, we're going to drain and winterize your skimmer lines, um, remove all the skimmer parts, <clears throat> cover the skimmers, or take all the ladders and diving boards out and stuff like that. Um, install the pool covers and engine backwash and drain the filter tanks, remove uh, the pump plugs and the drain uh, pump, and treat pool with proper chemicals and winterize the pool. So we do not, just to be clear, we winterize the pool plumbing. We do not winterize any municipal water plumbing. So any freshwater plumbing, uh, we do not do. So that we can do that at an additional cost upon request, but it's not automatically done. The reason is that most of our clients like to keep their uh, restroom facilities operating during the off season, um, beyond, beyond pool season. And so that's why we, we don't do that. And it's an additional cost to do that. <clears throat> If you contract with us for winter maintenance, then we are going to be coming out twice a month, which is highly recommended. Basically, um, when we do that, we're, we are checking your water level, lowering it if you've got any excess water. We are inspecting your pump room equipment, and we are adding chemicals as needed. With our winter maintenance package, we guarantee against spring startup charges that would be caused by things like algae outbreaks, staining, or any freeze damage to any of the equipment that we've winterized. So this client, did not hire us for winter maintenance, and they had somebody come in and do a pump room renovation after, it was not us, after we did, uh, we closed the, the pool down for the winter, and the vendor who did it started the system up to test their work to verify to the client that everything was working, but then they never redrained the plumbing. So the plumbing was full of water, and we had a hard freeze that winter, and literally all the hard work that they had put in in that pump room renovation was ruined in one freeze break. Uh, and finally, customer feedback. We are always accessible to talk about any question or concern that you have. Please do not wait to the end of the season to bring a concern to our attention because there, uh, oftentimes at that point, there's not much we can do to resolve it. Um, but if we know when it happens, we can work with you collaboratively to resolve the issue. We do send out surveys mid-season, so participate in those and you have uh, opportunity to win fun prizes if you could uh, we pick uh, survey drawing winners. And follow us on social media. We have very active accounts on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Not as much on Twitter, but um, those, those other three we are on uh, regularly updating, uh, particularly for important news uh, or just sometimes fun interaction. We love to hear from you online as well. Please leave us a review on Google, Facebook, Yelp, or you can go, even go to our website at seriouspool.com and there's a place to put a review in there. If you have any questions, contact us. Uh, 
you know how to reach us, 770-993-7492 or service.request.searchpool.com. We look forward to a fantastic season with you. Thank you for listening.